Hello everyone, hope you're all okay in these uh, really odd and strange times. Uh, May and I are filming the first part of this uh, little pre-recorded church service and uh, it's such a beautiful day today we thought we'd do it outside and uh, against the background of this uh, lovely blossom on this apple tree. So we do hope this service be really good and helpful for you and um, so I'm going to welcome you with a proper Christian greeting and then we're going to pray. So grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for all those who will be watching this service. I ask you to bless them and I ask that you by your Holy Spirit will speak to them and open their minds and hearts to receive from you whatever you have to say. And I pray Heavenly Father that you would help us all to set our hearts and our minds on loving you and loving our neighbours as ourselves. And I ask this in the name of your Son, our only Saviour and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And the prayer, the collect prayer for this fourth Sunday after Easter. Let's pray. Almighty God, you alone can order the unruly wills and passions of sinful people. Grant that your people may love what you command and desire what you promise, so that among the many and varied changes of this world, our hearts may be firmly fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Bye everyone. Hope you're doing okay. Well, thank you, Gary and Maybell. Can I add my welcome? Uh, I'm Gary Tubbs. I'm the uh, Associate Minister. And this service is our first foray into streaming. Well, in lockdown, we can't meet as church in the way we'd like to. But uh, in the spirit, we can join together to worship our Lord and God. While we are from villages, uh, around Henham, Elsinham and Ugly. As Christians, we are part of a much wider fellowship of believers. And in this service, we'll be helped by musicians from uh, other churches who have recorded songs and made them available in the Music Ministry website, especially for churches to stream. When we do get to the songs, the lyrics will be up on the screen. So turn up the volume and praise the Lord. Our first song is by Emu, a lovely song performed by Philip and Alana. This song reminds us that our victory is in Jesus Christ crucified and risen. He is our hope, is our joy and our strength. i 
As a church family at Henham, Elsinham and Ugly, we have been looking at the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, to the church in Corinth. Paul is a major leader of the early church and wrote a large proportion of the New Testament section of the Bible. Paul's letters are recognised by Christians around the world as not only the words of Paul, but also the words of God. So when we listen to these words, and reflect on them. We should pray that God will speak to us and that he will, we will be receptive to what he has to say to us. Andy and Sammy are going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 starting at verse 1. We'll be using the NIV UK version. You can google it or follow in your own Bible. So a short prayer. Father God we pray Lord that uh, you will open our hearts and minds to hear what you would, you would have us hear. May we listen and may we meet you. Amen. Today's reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 1 to 23. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defence to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us, because when the ploughman ploughs and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with everything, anything rather than hinder, hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights. I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel... I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel I may offer it free of charge, and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law, 
though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It seems that every time you put on the news, it's dominated by the coronavirus pandemic. Statistics of deaths in care homes and hospitals. Do we now have more deaths than all the other European countries? Questions about PPE, easing the lockdown, testing, worries about a second wave and recession. And testimony after testimony of bereaved families. It seems unrelenting. Life is fragile and we are waging a war against a deadly enemy. When will it end? We've just commemorated VE Day, uh, marking the ending of nearly six years of a war that had cost the lives of millions, had destroyed homes, families and cities and had brought huge suffering and separated loved ones. Don't we long for a VC Day? A victory over COVID-19 day. Will, I wonder, the UK lockdown be uh, significantly eased on uh, what people are describing as uh, Happy Monday? The Second World War couldn't be ignored. The efforts of the nation, its economy, its people were directed at defeating the common enemy. And the nation, by and large, pulled together in unity. But... There, were, there, were, there, there is human greed and sin. And uh, there were those who profiteered unfairly through the crisis, through the black market and shoddy deals. In our current battle against COVID-19, we hear stories about people charging extortionate rates for PPE or excessively increasing the prices of other goods, taking advantage of people's fears, testing kits, that don't work or, or, or don't even arrive, faulty PPE that is not fit for purpose. In the news recently was a Kingdom Church in Camberwell, London, which was selling fake coronavirus cures for £91. You got a bottle of divine cleansing oil and some red yarn to protect you from coronavirus. An employee of the church said we are helping the nation. We're convinced this cures coronavirus. We've sold nearly 2,000 of these. I wonder, does that, does that make you cross? Does that make you angry? It seems particularly awful because the virus is so dangerous. The stakes are so high, it's a matter of life and death. And at such times, we, should, we are called to think of others. But I also think that the actions of the Kingdom Church, I fear, trashes the Christian message. And that is a matter of spiritual life and death, a matter of eternity. The stakes are so high because people's eternal destiny is of paramount importance. How Christians act in these times can show love or manipulation, care for others or self-centred obsession. It can help or hinder the good news of Jesus. It can help people to come to know salvation and eternal life or to lose out on the rescue offered through the gospel. I'm currently reading a book called The Heart of Christ by Thomas Goodwin. He was a Christian Puritan, preacher, pastor, teacher, and a former president of Magdalen College, Oxford, and chaplain to Cromwell. His early preaching for seven years was introspective and grim as he looked within. His preaching tended to be about battering people's consciences until he was told to look outwards, not to trust in himself, in anything in, within himself, but to rest on Christ alone. And only then was he free. He was told by Richard Sibbs, a wonderful Christ-centred preacher, young man, if ever you would do good, you must preach the gospel and the free grace of God in Christ Jesus. 
And that is just what he did. And that is just what Paul, the apostle, did and what informs his letter to the church in Corinth, the gospel and the free grace of God in Christ Jesus. When it comes to Paul's actions, the exercise of his freedom and his rights, he kept the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ to the forefront. There was an eternal battle going on and the gospel of Christ brings rescue and salvation. Paul would avoid anything that would bring that wonderful message into disrepute. Now, Paul wrote in the first century when uh, people had, who had seen Jesus were still living and Paul himself had personally met the risen Lord and had been transformed from a persecutor of the church to a wonderful pastor, teacher and servant and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He writes to the church in Corinth, which has many blessings, but also many problems. They prize their freedom and their supposed spiritual maturity, but they needed humbling and fixing their gaze on Jesus. In chapter 8, Paul challenges them and us not to allow the exercise of our faith, uh, exercise of our freedom, to be a stumbling block to others in the faith. And now in Corinthians chapter 9, Paul shows them how he applies the limits of Christian freedom to his own life. Paul certainly believed in applying his teaching to himself. Today, perhaps we might have less government advisers having to resign if they applied their advice on COVID-19 to themselves. Later in the letter, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now it's quite a long chapter and there's much that I will have to skirt over. I urge you to read through it afterwards and ask God to help you by his spirit to reflect on the truths contained. Paul starts out, Firstly, by setting out his credentials as an apostle, then he looks at his rights as an apostle, and then he explains why he doesn't uh, exercise those rights. Now, we are not apostles, and few of us are in full-time Christian ministry, or preach and teach, but Paul's reasons for not exercising his rights as an apostle have important lessons for each and every one of us. So do keep listening. Firstly, Paul's credentials as an apostle. An apostle is one who had witnessed that Jesus had risen to life after death and was sent to speak of him. Paul was challenged by some over his apostolic authority. Should we listen to Paul? Well, yes. Paul had seen the risen Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. Look down with me at verse 1, if you have your Bible with you. At the start of the letter, he calls himself an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And here in verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 9, he talks of his apostleship in the Lord and speaks of the validation that he was commissioned to pass on the good news of Jesus by the very evidence, by the evidence of their very lives. The Christians in Corinth are the result, the fruit of Paul's work in the Lord. He was, they were, the seal of his apostleship. Secondly, Paul's rights as an apostle. In verses 3 to 6, Paul argues that he has the right as an apostle to sustenance, to be married and to have a wife accompany him. Now, it would seem that Paul was not married. He may well have been widowed. And he had the right to be fully supported without the distraction of having to work for a living. Paul argues from everyday life. Verse 7, these rights as an apostle are obvious, as obvious as the rights of soldiers to get paid, or the right of a vineyard owner to the harvest and shepherds to the milk. He even quotes Old Testament precedent from Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 
where even the ox is not to be muzzled when treading out the grain. And he concludes his defence of his rights as an apostle in verses 11 and 12. So read this through with me. Verse 11. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? And then in verse 14, he says that the Lord Jesus himself has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So there it is. Paul, as an apostle, has every right to full support for his gospel work among the Corinthians, but he won't take financial support from them. In verse 12, we did not use this right. So we've gone from Paul's credentials, firstly, as an apostle, and, and secondly, to his rights as an apostle, and now thirdly, why Paul does not exercise his rights as an apostle. Now here's the important bit for all of us. Paul won't use his rights as an apostle for financial support from the Corinthians. Why? The answer is in verse 12. Have a look. It's because of the gospel of Christ. And verse 23, it's for the sake of the gospel. You see, nothing must hinder the gospel of Christ Everything must advance it. No exercise of rights is more important than the gospel. Paul is so wedded to the gospel that he says in verse 16, For I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul wants to offer this gospel, verse 18, free of charge, so not to make use of my rights in preaching it. Or perhaps better translated, and so not make full use or even abuse of my rights in preaching it. The gospel is a matter of spiritual life and death. By it, Paul hopes to, as we see in verse 19, to win as many as possible. Now the word that's translated to win means to cause a loss, not to happen. He also describes in verse 22, the gospel is the means of saving some. The gospel is about rescue. Paul is not concerned with winning people to a cause, to an idea or a way of thinking, but winning people to Christ, about saving people's souls through a personal relationship, a personal encounter with Christ, our Saviour. The Gospel is good news because it affects a momentous rescue, a rescue that Paul knows full well for himself, and he wants it for others. But it is good news only in and through Christ. The rescue only comes through the person and work of Jesus Christ. It is the Gospel of Christ. Journey with me to chapter 15 of this letter where Paul more explicitly talks of the content of the good news. From verse 15, uh, chapter 15 rather, verse 1. Now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Christ crucified, dying for our sins and being raised again. The good news of Jesus is that he died to save you. He did it, not you. 
So Paul's preaching was all about Christ crucified, that we, and we see that in chapters 1 and 2. His message was not about what we do, but what has been done for us by Jesus. This is all of grace, not merit. We don't deserve Christ to die for us. His offer of forgiveness of sins and peace with God the Father and eternal fellowship in the presence of God is a free and undeserved gift. Isn't that wonderful? It's no wonder then that Paul chooses not to take payment from the Corinthians lest they think that the gospel is not free. So Paul worked as a tent maker and many missionaries today work a trade alongside their mission work. Now this doesn't preclude ministers from being supported by the churches they minister in. Indeed, Paul did receive uh, support from others, such as the church in Philippi. But Paul didn't want anyone in Corinth to think that he was profiteering from the free gospel of Christ. Churches provide their ministers with resources to enable them to be free to serve. But in America, some televangelists are milking people for all they can get, and even some so-called churches uh, this side uh, of the Atlantic in, in, in Britain um, do the same. It is quite worrying at a time when people are searching, spiritually searching the internet, what do they find? Can they distinguish between the real gospel and the false gospel? Churches need finances to resource their ministry and outreach. Some parishes need support from other wealthier parishes if gospel ministry is to continue and missionaries need prayer and financial support from others. We must do all that we can to help people see that the gospel is good news, that we love them and we want to serve them and that the gospel is a free gift of grace through Jesus Christ. Paul wanted to remove obstacles to the gospel and would tailor his approach to those he was trying to reach, acting more as a servant of others than a master. From verse 19 we see he was sensitive when he preached and ministered to Jews, those under the law, and non-Jews, those not having the law alike, showing a flexibility, setting aside his personal preferences when things were morally indifferent from a standpoint of God's revealed word, concluding in verse 22 and 3, I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Paul's heart was to help people, help to bring people to salvation. Of course, that is a work of God, but he wanted to do his part for people to know the blessings of the gospel. Let us reflect on Paul's heartbeat and put a high priority on the free gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In both our Christian lives and the life and witness of the church, we are in serious times. COVID-19 is a deadly disease, but sin is even deadlier. COVID-19 thankfully doesn't kill all who catch it. But in reality, all will one day die and we will all face our maker. We will all meet the Lord Jesus, but will he be our judge or our saviour? Will we turn to him now to have Jesus bearing the punishment for our sins on the cross on our behalf? Will we find a welcome in his presence and be guaranteed eternal life? Or will we reject the Lord of life and receive only condemnation as we bear the full weight of judgment for our sins all on our own? Christ died for us that we might live in him and live for him and live with him forever. The stakes are very high. Eternal life or death, heaven or hell. 
We must all do our part for the war effort to combat sin and death. How? By looking to our rescuer, by trusting in the gospel of Christ and telling others about that gospel. If you are a Christian, be thankful that you've been rescued, that Jesus is victorious over sin and death. On Thursdays, we clap for the healthcare workers and for other key workers, and that is so right and proper to do so. They deserve our deep gratitude. But as a Christian, I'd like to say that each and every day we should applaud and honour Jesus, who showed utmost care by offering his life, the sinless and perfect one, for sinful rebels like you and me, that we might know peace with God and fellowship with him forever, our Christian life now and our future is all dependent on Jesus. There is a hope beyond COVID-19, beyond death itself, and it's all through Jesus. And that is good news. If you haven't trusted in Jesus uh, yet, then I'd urge you to come to him to find out more about him by reading one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke or John, or perhaps go on one of the online Christianity Explored courses that our church and others offer. Paul kept the gospel or the good news of Christ right to the forefront. There is an eternal battle being waged and the gospel of Jesus Christ brings rescue and salvation. COVID-19, the coronavirus, shows up our frailty, our mortality, and it can make us fearful. But there can be another fear that we can succumb to, the fear of change. The fear that God might indeed be real and that coming to him would result in a change of life. Can I just say, if that's what you think, if you're sitting on the fence, that that change of life wrought by God is the best. God is good. Jesus is the best of friends, the best, most loving, most perfect, most compassionate, most wonderfully glorious and most fully alive person you will ever meet. But then, he is God's son and he did die for you. So turn to him and live for him. Let us pray. Father God, Paul's concern, Paul's focus was for the free gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. May that shape what we think and do as individuals and as churches. May we trust in Jesus and know a joy and peace and a hope that will never disappoint. May we truly, truly know that Jesus is the greatest good news. Amen. And now we are going to have our prayers and Rocky and Jackie will lead them uh, and it will end with the Lord's Prayer. Please uh, join in if you can. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you God, that you remain a constant presence in our lives amidst a constantly changing world. You are full of grace and mercy, and we praise you and glorify you for our very existence. Thank you that in your great mercy, and while we were still sinners, your Son came to rescue us, taking our sin upon himself and nailing it to the cross. May our lives reflect all that you have done for us in our service to you, in how we live our, out our lives and in the spreading of your word to a world that is lost. We pray for the furtherance of the gospel and thank you for Jesus' powerful words in the Great Commission as he charged his followers at the end of the book of Matthew to take your word to all the nations. We thank you for churches everywhere throughout history that have faithfully shared the good news to others. We marvel at how the modern technologies mean we can now meet while still apart. We thank you for our church here today in this benefice, for the clear teaching we receive 
and the importance of being true to your word when faced with a world that is so hostile to its message. May we always be bold in telling others about the certain hope we have in the death and resurrection of your dear Son, Jesus, and that he is our loving Saviour. We give you thanks for all those who have recovered from the coronavirus in the last few days and ask that we will gradually return to full strength. We pray for those who face an uncertain future from a work perspective, whose jobs are at risk at this difficult time. May they continue to trust in you for their strength and for guidance. We pray especially as a church family for those we know who are affected. Help us to find ways to support and help them. We pray for the wider church and for the appointment of the new Bishop of Chelmsford. We pray for wisdom in the appointing to that role. And we do ask that the man who is chosen is rooted in your word and will have a real fire in his heart to win souls for you. May it be a real turning point for true gospel evangelism in Essex, leading to many turning to you as their Lord and Saviour. We pray for your church throughout the world, that you may bless our brothers and sisters in far off places. May you protect them from danger, comfort them in their troubles, and may they always rejoice as they serve you every day. We think of those charities we support. Our mission partner this month is Stork Valley Schools Trust. They're not able to work in the schools uh, during the lockdown and they've had to furlough their school workers. May they continue trusting in you and we pray for their speedy return to schools when they open. It is an uncertain world we live in, especially during this global pandemic. We ask that you comfort those who are grieving the loss of loved ones from this terrible disease. In these times of great worry and despair, we ask that many will turn to you as the only saviour who never disappoints and who will always welcome the lost back into your arms. And as we think of all those who are feeling lost and troubled, we remember those we know and love who are suffering in mind and body from other burdens and anxieties, those who have long-term illness and pains both physically and spiritually. Please bring comfort and hope when they're feeling pain and despair. We think of those who are suffering financially due to the effects of the lockdown and the uncertainty of work in the future. We pray for families with children off school and the difficulties that this brings. Heavenly Father, you know the fears and anxieties on the hearts of everyone this day. May your peace and closeness be a real blessing and comfort to us all. Amen. Amen. Right, if we join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 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 This next song is particularly poignant for these times of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tim Chester has written, Christ will be my hideaway, a new congregational song based on Psalm 91, where the psalmist encourages us to find refuge in the shelter of the Most High and the shadow of the Almighty, so that we do not fear the pestilence that strikes in the darkness nor the plague that destroys us at midday. It's a great psalm of comfort at any time, but it seems especially relevant to our current anxieties, and I hope you will find comfort in it. My son David has recorded it for our blessing.
perhaps in this time of lockdown you've started to think more about God. Maybe you would like to trust in him. You would like to more know more about Jesus. Well, here is a short clip about our Christianity Explored course. Our closing hymn is an old favourite, but this is a modern arrangement. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering son. David again has recorded it with the help of other musicians from his church in Fulham.
thank you for uh, being with us. Uh, I hope you found the whole service a blessing. Um, and if you want to find out a little bit more uh, about what we do, then you can go to our website, heuchurch.co.uk. God bless you. Keep safe.